Hello everyone, this video is about scrub typhus and the sources of, our, uh, of today's lecture is uh, I have taken from Harrison's Internal Medicine and Optidate. So let's start with the topic. Scrub typhus, it falls under the uh, category of rickettsial diseases that are caused by the bacteria rickettsii. These are small, obligately intracellular gram-negative cocobacilli and short bacilli and they are usually transmitted by bites from ticks, mites, fleas and loose vector. And these uh, bacteria, they infect a range of host cell types including endothelial cells, the monocytes, the macrophages and even dendritic cells. So out of these rickettsial diseases, today's video is about scrub typhus. So let's begin with it. The scrub typhus is caused by the bacteria Orensia susugamusi. It is a mite-borne infectious disease, which means it is transferred by bite from a mite. The reservoir and vector of scrub typhus are larval stages of trombiculid mites, and they are also known as chiggers. The Orensia susugamusi bacteria can transfer to other mites via trans ovarial transmission so there is a transfer from one generation of mites to other generation via the trans ovarial route and at least 8 out of 60 species of these mites are capable of transmitting scrub typhus and this bacteria when it is uh, bitten by the mite it disseminates widely onto the skin and these mites as a uh, which is shown in this picture here these are mainly found on the scrub vegetations like shrubs low woody plants and bushes and these lay eggs usually in the monsoon season hence scrub typhus uh, is more common in wet seasons the risk factors for scrub typhus includes agricultural workers with significant outdoor exposures and similar to this other occupations like uh, army so those people who are in army and are constantly under exposure in outdoor environment, they are also at a uh, higher risk of developing scrub typhus. And approximately 80% of the cases occur in summer and autumn season, that is really, uh, between July and November. And the elderly people are at more risk for developing this severe form of scrub typhus. Now coming to the most important section of uh, this lecture that is the clinical manifestations because uh, by looking at the clinical manifestations we can uh, classify the disease, we can uh, do the initial diagnosis and that will also decide the treatment of the disease as well. Hence it is very important. Okay, So the clinical manifestations of scrub typhus uh, has a very wide variations that can range from mild and self-limiting disease all the way up to end organ failure and even causing death. A systematic review that included 19,644 patients with untreated scrub typhus revealed that uh, there is a mortality rate of 6% in people with scrub typhus. So the median mortality rate is 6% but the range of mortality rate is from 0 to 70 percent so the mortality rate can go uh, as high as 70 percent which is a huge number and this is usually higher in older patients uh, who also have a lot of other uh, comorbidities the incubation period of scrub typhus ranges from 6 to 21 days that is around one to three weeks now let's talk about the clinical features or the presentations of scrub typhus. Most patients they present with a fever. This occurs usually around a week after the bite from the infected larval form of the mite. And this fever it usually lasts for longer period that is between 9 to 19 days. Usually this lasts for around 14 days but it can range from 9 to 19 days. And this is associated with headaches, myalgias, muscle pains, and many other uh, systemic symptoms like respiratory symptoms, which includes uh, simple cough and uh, can be as serious as developing acute respiratory distress syndrome. 
the chest x-ray of some people might show bilateral reticular opacities okay so this will suggest ards the cardiovascular signs uh, may show relative bradycardia in almost two third of patients with scrub typhus so what is relative bradycardia this is when uh, the heart rate increases by only less than 10 bits per minute when there is one degree celsius rise in the temperature okay so normally when there is a rise in the temperature or when the patient is suffering from fever when okay so when there is fever a rise in the temperature we expect the heart rate also to rise and the normal response would be when there is rise in uh, the temperature by mo uh, one degree celsius the heart rate should rise by more than 10 bits per minute but in case of relative bradycardia the heart rate rises only less than 10 bits per minute or it doesn't arises at all Hence, this is called as relative bradycardia. The other cardiovascular manifestations may be myocarditis and pericardial effusions, but uh, these are not very common. The GI symptoms can also be affected and uh, the uh, uh, medical person might confuse this with other diseases like salmonella uh, that can cause typhoid. Okay, so one fourth of the patients with scrub typhus may develop nausea, vomiting or diarrhea and there can be some endoscopic changes as well. Okay, so uh, the epithelial cells of the GI tract can be affected and cause superficial ulcers, the erosions or in some cases there can be actively bleeding ulcers as well. The CNS manifestations might be many meningitis, encephalitis, stroke can be there if the vessels are in involved and there can also be seizure in case of renal uh, features there can be acute kidney injury in severe cases and uh, some of these patients might even need dialysis so these were the clinical features now uh, there are a few classical features of scrub typhus and the most common among them is the formation of a scar so the scar formation as shown in this picture here it is formed where the at the site of the beaten area okay so where the mite has beaten the uh, scar is formed there uh, if you want to know the pathogenesis of this so here you can see in this picture here this is the mite that is biting and this has this structures these jawline structures these are known as chelicerae and with this structure it helps to attach into the skin and it this might will release some digestive enzymes and these enzymes will uh, dissolve all these tissues and it will form this uh, opening here and this opening is known as stylostome okay so this is the pathogenesis of the bite from this infected mite okay so the mite will attach to the skin via jaw like structure called chelicerae and this will secrete digestive enzymes that will liquefy the epidermal cells and this results into tube like opening called stylostome and the larva will then feed into the lysed or the dead tissues and the lymphatic fluids so this is the pathogenesis of this uh, mite okay and that's how the scar is also formed so first there is bite which will later turn into painless papule this papule will undergo central necrosis and lastly there will be formation of a scar with black crust so as you are seeing in this picture there is a scar with black crust okay and occasionally these scars may uh, can be atypical and they will lack a typical black crust so as shown in this picture right here okay so this is a typical scar with a black crust here is a atypical scar and there is no black crust according to there is some uh, research articles 60 to 88 percent of people can have scar but some fail to notice this because of the locations of this scar like in case of uh, not easily visibly area, visible areas like axilla or the back areas or the genital or pubic areas 
and the other classical feature is regional lymphadenopathy where the lymph nodes can be swollen and there can be maculopapular rashes as shown in this picture right here these rashes usually develop on day four to six of illness only less than 40 percent of people develop rashes and uh, these rashes they typically begin on the abdomen and they spread to the extremities so these were the uh, clinical features of uh, scrub typhus now coming to the lab findings there are not many uh, specific lab uh, findings in case of scrub typhus so some of the findings are thrombocytopenia which can be seen in severe cases there are deranged LFTs, uh, bilirubin level and creatinine level if these there is inorgan failure and there can be changes in the WBC count obviously because there is an infection. So now finally coming to the diagnosis of scrub typhus. The initial diagnosis of scrub typhus is made based on the history. Uh, the most important of them is recent travel to endemic areas and uh, also looking at the clinical signs and the lab findings as well and as soon as the initial diagnosis of scrub typhus is suspected the treatment should be started immediately all right so as the initial diagnosis is suspected the treatment should be started immediately and the other forms of diagnostic tests can be uh, serologic test this is the most common method of diagnosis uh, and uh, it is also uh, more commonly used in uh, institutions of very uh, developing countries as well so the serologic tests include uh, indirect fluorescent test which is the investigation of choice here the indirect immunoperoxidase test and other enzyme link immunoassays tests okay so the test kits for scrub typhus are also commonly available uh, and they look like this here you can see the control band and the test band and if there is bands double bands on both then it will uh, say that the scrub typhus is positive okay and some test kits will also uh, give the type of antibodies here the other form of diagnosis is taking biopsy of this scar which will show lymphohistiocytic vasculitis however this is done only in case of challenging cases where it is very hard to make diagnosis clinically then another good form of diagnosis is PCR amplification of this bacterial genes but uh, this is rarely needed and not uh, performed commonly okay the differential diagnosis of scrub typhus may include malaria and dengue, leptospirosis, salmonella typhi and other rickettsial diseases. Okay, But we don't uh, usually focus on other rickettsial diseases because the treatment is similar as that of scrub typhus. Now finally coming to the treatment section here. The treatment of scrub typhus should be started immediately as soon as the diagnosis is made uh, delayed antibiotic treatment has been associated with increased chances of organ failure and there is increase in number of hospitalization days okay, so hence treatment should be started immediately the approach to treatment depends on the severity of the disease all right so First, we will classify the disease based on the severity and then we'll treat them accordingly. All right? So on the classification, there is the first there is mild to moderate cases where the patients present with only mild symptoms or symptoms of acute febrile illness like fever, myalgia, headache, rashes and cough. Okay, remember there is no signs of any organ failure in mild to moderate cases. However, in severe cases, with all these above features, there is also signs of end organ failure. Okay, so if the levers are involved, there is features of hyperbilirubinemia or transaminitis. There are features of renal failure, increase in creatinine level, increase in urea level, cardiovascular collapse. There is hypertension, shock, acute respiratory distress syndrome, and 
features of CNS like meningoencephalitis. So these are all the signs of end organ failure. And if these any of these are present, then we will classify it as severe disease. Right. So now coming to the treatment of according to the classes. Okay. So for mild to moderate disease, the monotherapy with doxycycline or azithromycin is suggested. If we are going to use doxycycline, then 100 mg dose BD that is given orally. All right. So given for 7 to 15 days, usually we prefer for 7 days. Okay. So uh, doxycycline is usually preferred over azithromycin because this will also act against other rickettsial diseases. Then we also can use azithromycin 500 mg per day for three days. Okay, all right. So um, these are the uh, drugs that are preferred in case of mild to moderate diseases. For severe diseases, monotherapy is the preferred one, and that is too with doxycycline. Okay, so doxycycline monotherapy is preferred for severe disease. The difference here is that on day one of doxycycline, we give 200 mg. All right. In mild to moderate, we had given 100 mz in all days, but in severe disease, we start with 200 mz BD on day one, and then continue with 100 mz BD up to day seven. So that's the difference in monotherapy, in case of severe disease. Okay, the combination therapy of doxycycline and azithromycin is uh, can also be used. However, the some studies they suggest that there is no significant difference. Uh, between the combination therapy and the monotherapy with doxycycline okay but this can also be used now there has to be some considerations in pregnancy in case of scrub typhus because it is associated with uh, spontaneous abortions or stillbirth in pregnant women all right so in pregnant women scrub typhus can cause spontaneous abortions or stillbirth some literature reviews showed that 44% of pregnant women with scrub typhus had poor neonatal outcomes that uh, include stillbirth, preterm birth, or low birth weight. Okay, and the preferred regimen in uh, scrub typhus is azithromycin 500 mg OD once a day for 7 days. So this, uh, this is the preferred regimen. Why azithromycin? Because it is comparatively more safer to use in pregnancy so that's this is the regimen for pregnancy okay now coming to the prevention of scrub typhus till date there are no vaccines that are available use insect repellents while walking outside okay that should contain deet the chemical you can apply it to skin or even clothing for clothing, there is a drug called permethrin that can be applied onto the clothing. And uh, alternatively, you can also wash the clothes that are uh, exposed outside with hot water. So this can also be done to free the clothes, clothing from mites. You should wear full sleep uh, uh, upper uh, body clothes with gloves while walking outside and also try uh, putting on the trousers that are tucked inside the socks while walking outside okay so these are some preventive measures for scrub typhus so that's it for today thank you